Thick murky clouds fill the sky, with freezing winds carrying snow faster than 100 miles per hour. With a frigid minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, life threatening snowstorms and avalanches are frequent. And these are typical conditions on the world's highest mountain, Mount Everest. The behemoth towers 29,032 feet, 8,849 meters, between Nepal and Tibet in the Himalayas, with its peak surpassing most clouds in the sky. An attempt to climb Everest requires months, sometimes years, of training and conditioning, even then, reaching the summit is far from guaranteed. In fact, more than 300 people are known to have died on the mountain. And yet the mountain still draws hundreds of climbers who are determined to reach its peak every spring. Here's what it takes to make the climb and what has motivated some climbers to summit the world's highest peak. Drive. Jacob Weasel, a trauma surgeon, successfully summited Everest last May after conditioning for nearly a year. I would put on a 50-pound backpack and do two hours on a stair stepper with no problem, Weasel told BBN. So, I thought that I was in pretty good shape. However, the surgeon said he was humbled after discovering that his fitness was no match for the lofty athleticism required by the mountain. I would take five steps and have to take 30 seconds to a minute to catch my breath. Weasel recalled of his struggle with the lack of oxygen available while ascending Everest. Climbers aiming for the summit usually practice an acclimatizing rotation to adjust their lungs to the thinning oxygen levels once they arrive on the mountain. This process involves mountaineers traveling upward to one of the four designated camps on Everest and spending one to four days there before traveling back down. This routine is repeated at least two times to allow the body to adapt to declining oxygen levels. It increases a climber's chances of survival and summiting. If you took somebody and just plopped them up at the high camp on Everest, not even on the top, they would probably go into a coma within 10 to 15 minutes, Weasel said and they would be dead within an hour because their body is not adjusted to that low of oxygen levels. While Weasel has successfully summited dozens of mountains, including Kilimanjaro, 19,341 feet, Chimborazo, 20,549 feet, Cotopaxi, 19,347 feet, and most recently Aconcagua, 22,837 feet, in January, he said none of them compares to the high altitude of Mount Everest because no matter how well you are trained, once you get to the limits of what the human body can take, it's just difficult, he continued. At its highest altitude, Everest is nearly incapable of sustaining human life and most mountaineers use supplementary oxygen above 23,000 feet. The lack of oxygen poses one of greatest threats to climbers who attempt to summit, with levels dropping to less than 40% when they reach the Everest death zone. The first target for mountaineers is Everest Base Camp at approximately 17,000 feet, which takes climbers about two weeks. Then they ascend to the three remaining camp stationed along the mountain. Camp 4, the final one before the summit, sits along the edge of the death zone at 26,000 feet, exposing climbers to an extremely thin layer of air, sub-zero temperatures, and high winds powerful enough to blow a person off the mountain. It's difficult to survive up there, Weasel told BBN. He recalls passing bodies of climbers who died on the mountain, which isn't uncommon. The bodies of the fallen mountaineers are well preserved, exhibiting little to no decay due to the intense cold temperatures. I am probably more familiar with death and the loss of life than most people, the surgeon said. For me it was just a reminder of the gravity of the situation and the fragility of what life is. Even more so motivation for appreciating the opportunity. High Altitude Cerebral Edema, HACE is one of the most common illnesses climbers face while attempting to summit. Your brain is starved of oxygen, Weasel said. ASE results in the brain swelling during its attempt to regain stable oxygen levels, causing drowsiness, trouble speaking and thinking. This confusion is often accompanied by blurred vision and sporadic episodes of delusion. I had auditory hallucinations where I was hearing voices, of friends, that I thought were coming from behind me, Weasel recalled. And I had visual hallucinations he added. I was seeing the faces of my children and my wife coming out of the rocks. Weasel recalled crossing paths with a friend, Oriane Amard, who was trapped on the mountain due to an injury. I remember staring at her for like five minutes and just saying, I'm so sorry, Weasel said. I've spent over a decade of my life training to help people as a surgeon, and being in a position where there's somebody who requires your help and you are unable to offer any assistance. That feeling of helplessness was tough to deal with, Weasel told BBN. Amard survived. She was rescued and suffered from several broken bones in her foot, 
in addition to severe frostbite on her hands. Despite all her injuries, Amart is considered one of the lucky ones. Everest has long been a tomb for climbers who have succumbed to harsh conditions or accidents on its slopes. When a loved one or fellow climber is severely injured or dies on the mountain, it's routine to leave them behind if you're unable to save them, according to Alan Arnett, a mountaineer coach who summited Everest in 2014. What most teams do out of respect for that climber, they will move the body out of sight, he said. And that's only if they can. Sometimes that's just not practical because of the bad weather or because their bodies will get frozen into the mountain, Arnett told BBN. So, it's very difficult to move them. 